from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our Books and Beyond program. I'm Guy Molinar from the Center for the Book, and the Center for the Book is co-sponsoring this talk today. Um, we're the division of the library that promotes books, reading, libraries, and literacy, and we also administer here at the library the Young Readers Center and the Poetry and Literature Center, which are over in the Jefferson Building. Um, our mission is carried out nationwide. We do that here through the National Center, but we also have a state center in every state in D.C., and we also have one in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And we also have a partnership of 80 like-minded literacy organizations that we work with. Additionally, we play an important role in the National Book Festival, and this year's festival is Saturday, September 24th at the Washington Convention Center. And if you've never been to this, National Book Festival, I urge you to come because it's a wonderful event. It's a great way to uh, meet your favorite authors. And you can find out more about the book festival at loc.gov slash bookfest. Um, before we get started, I just ask that you please turn off all your electronic devices. And I need to tell you that we're recording today's event. So if you ask a question, you will become part of our webcast. And we also have C-SPAN here today, so you'll be part of theirs as well. Um, you can view our webcasts at the Center for the Book website, which is read.gov, and there you'll find more than 250 uh, book discussions that we've had over many years. Uh, today's author's book will be for sale just outside the entrance of this room, and following her presentation, she will be signing the book, and it's also a chance for you to talk to her further about her work. The chief criterion we have for deciding which books we feature in our series is that the writer must have used the Library of Congress. And in this case, of course, the, that is obvious with our Jacob Reese collection. Um, this program is presented, in fact, in conjunction with the exhibition created by the Interpretive Programs, Pro Programs Office here at the library. And this is the brochure where you've, you will find out more information about this great exhibition, which is over in the Jefferson Building. The exhibition is called Jacob Reese, Revealing How the Other Half Lives. And it's a co-presentation of the library and the Museum of the City of New York. And it's on display in Jefferson Building through September 5th, 2016. The exhibition and its programming were made possible by generous donors listed on the back of this exhibition brochure, which you can find at the exit to this event. Today's program is co-sponsored with the Interpretive Programs Office, and thank you very much for bringing that program with us today. Um, also with us is someone from the publishing office who has worked on the, the book, the beautiful book that accompanies the exhibition, and that is Amy Hess, who is a writer-editor in the publishing office, where she has worked since 2003. Amy has written two books while there, Women Who Dare, Helen Keller, and Women Who Dare, Margaret Mead. And as an editor, Amy has worked on scores of books relating to the Library of Congress's vast collections on topics ranging from the Renaissance map making to our collections of photographs documenting Depression-era America. In recent years, Amy has pioneered the library's digital publishing program with the 2013 e-books, Great Photographs from the Library of Congress and Michigan I.O., Alan Lomax, and the 1938 Library of Congress Folklife Exhibition. She is currently editing the forthcoming book and e-book, Home Place, which will highlight the Michael Ford collection in the American Folklife Center. Please welcome Amy Hess. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm here to introduce Bonnie Yokelson, with whom I was lucky enough to work on the Jacob Reese book, uh, Jacob A. Reese Revealing How the Other Half Lives. Bonnie is originally from the DC area, um, but she's made her longtime home in New York City. She graduated from Swarthmore College and then pursued a master's and a doctorate in art history from New York University. Early in her career, she was back in DC, working in the print room at the National Gallery of Art. And from 1987 to 1991, she was the curator of prints and photographs at the Museum of the City of New York. And that's where she was first able to work with the Jacob Reese collection of photographs. 
Since leaving the museum, she's been an independent curator and photographic historian, working with such institutions as the New York Historical Society, the Columbia County Historical Society, and the South Street Seaport Museum. And since 1988, she has also taught in the MFA program in the Department of Photography, Video, and Related Media at the School of Visual Arts in New York, where she curates the annual thesis show and serves as a mentor to graduating students. In addition to the thesis show, Bonnie has curated numerous exhibitions, including Esther Bubbly, American photojournalist at the UBS Payne Weber Art Gallery in New York in 2001, um, that also traveled to other cities, and an exhibition titled Alfred Stieglitz, New York at the South Street Seap Seaport Museum in 2010. And of course, she uh, curated our current Jacob A. Reese exhibition, along with Barbara Baer in our manuscript division, um, which opened in a related but different format at the Museum of the City of New York um, before opening here in April. And it will also travel to two locations in Denmark. Um, Bonnie is also the author of many books, including Bernice Abbott, Changing New York, Alfred Stieglitz, New York, and a co-author with Daniel Citrum of Rediscovering Jacob Reese. She's also written books on the Clarence H. White School of Photography and Esther Bubbly, among other subjects. And of course, Bonnie also wrote the book that we are all here for today, Jacob A. Reese, Revealing New York's Other Half. Um, when Bonnie first began working on Reese more than two decades ago, Reese was remembered primarily as a photographer. And her subsequent scholarship has provided a much fuller picture of Reese as an immigrant who pulled himself up by his bootstraps, a journalist, an author, and a social reformer who considered photographs nothing more than a tool to spread his message. By seeing this fuller picture of Reese, and by reading his articles, books, lectures, and the personal papers that are housed here at the library, we can better understand the issues that New York's other half actually faced. Poverty, poor housing conditions, child labor, lack of access to education, homelessness, and disease. Most, if not all, of these issues are still with us today in one form or another, which makes Reese's work and Bonnie's more relevant than ever. Uh, as an editor, I have worked with a lot of different authors, and since I have the stage, I just want to take this opportunity to say what an absolute pleasure it was to work with Bonnie and how much I admire her as a scholar and an independent and a museum professional. It takes a certain kind of person to be successful as an independent scholar as someone who can manage her own time, meet deadlines, forge connections and partnerships, and find money to get big projects done. <laughs> While I was spending much of my time on this one project, she was simultaneously conducting original research, writing unique exhibition lists for different venues, teaching and coordinating, coordinating the senior thesis show at the School of Visual Arts, all while writing this book and compiling the first ever catalog of Reese's photographs. In the years it has taken to get these exhibitions mounted and this book published, Bonnie has worn every single type of hat in the business, and none of this could have been possible without her talent, energy, and passion for her subject. So with that, I will let Bonnie take the stage. Amy, thank you so much. I'm moved. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, okay, so I'm going to read <laughs> pretty much, and um, let's let's see what, what we have to say here. Um, the Jacob, I'm going to repeat a little bit of what Amy uh, did to just make sure that uh, we understand how these different parts of this project fit together. Uh, the Jacob Reese exhibition, now on view in the Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress, is the result of a collaboration of the past several years between the library and the Museum of the City of New York. The museum own, uh, owns the Reese's photographs of New York City slums in the late 19th century. These photographs are the earliest evidence of the disastrous effects of the forces of modernity on New York, whose slums were the worst on earth at that time. Because the city's economy was expanding so rapidly, it became a magnet for rural Americans and European immigrants seeking jobs and a better life. And although jobs were plentiful, the city did not have the housing, sanitation, or transportation system to meet their basic needs. New arrivals lived in hastily built tenements with little or no plumbing, and wages and rents were exploitative. 
People of all ages, including young children, worked in factories and did piecework in their homes. Education was not mandatory, and there were no public parks or playgrounds where children could play safely. Rees's photographs taken between 1887 and 1895 depicted all these urban ills. The collection is small. Rees only took about 250 pictures of New York, but it is unique, world famous, and in constant demand. Um, so just as a kind of signature image, I'm showing you Bandit's Roost, which is Reese's most famous picture. It shows some Italian toughs in an alley um, uh, in a neighborhood called Mulberry Bend, which he wrote much about and which was very close to his office. Um, let's see if I can get this going properly. And just to show you the sort of sense in which uh, Reese's images have been thoroughly disseminated. Um, this is, shows a recreation of Bandit's Roost by Martin Scorsese in his 2002 film, Gangs of New York. Reese is equally celebrated for his first book, How the Other Half Lives, which presented a passionate argument for addressing this crisis. Reese was a journalist by trade, and after years of covering the crime beat in New York, he began to write about urban poverty and the latest ideas to remedy it. His book has remained in print since it first appeared in 1890 and has become a landmark text in American history. This is, uh, shows you the first edition of the book. Uh, it's very small. Uh, I don't know. I should know this right now, like five by nine inches. Um, and... This shows you a recent edition. Uh, you can see how it, you know, it's, it's even called out on the cover, a Jacob Rees classic. Um, interestingly, the photograph on the front is not by Rees. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good picture of tenements. <laughs> Um, the Library of Congress owns the bulk of Reese's archive, which includes notes, manuscripts, off prints of articles, annotated scrapbooks of newspaper clippings, family letters, expense books, and much more. And just again to give you uh, some idea, uh, this is the first page of a, scrap, a small scrapbook in which Reese collected uh, the press comments on his very first lecture. It, it's, it reads here, press comments on the lecture, the other half, how it lives and dies in New York, illustrated with 100 photographic views by Jacob A. Reese, delivered for the first time January 25th, 1888, before the American Photographers Association at 122 West 36th Street, New York. So this gives you a sense of how, how uh, uh, aware he was of uh, uh, keeping track of, uh, of his career. Uh, for posterity. The current exhibition, which opened last fall in New York, as Amy said, and will travel this fall to Denmark, um, which is Reese's native country, brings together the museum's photographs and the library's archive for the very first time. In each venue, the show takes a different form, but each offers a rich portrait of Reese and his legacy. I first encountered Reese's photographs in 1987 when I took a job as curator of prints and photographs at the Museum of the City of New York. Reese was a professional, professional journalist, not a professional photographer, indeed not even a serious amateur photographer. Yet he is considered one of the great pioneers in the history of the medium. This is the puzzle that has kept me working on Reese on and off for, I have to say, nearly 30 years. Just a shocking thought. Um, but now, finally, I am done. Uh, today, I would like to share with you my journey with Reese and summarize my understanding of his accomplishments as a reformer and a photographer. Before becoming curator at the museum, I worked in the photography departments of three art museums. These museums collected individual prints by photographers who used the camera to create works of art. The Rees collection was unlike any I had ever seen. It consisted of 415 glass negatives, many of them copy negatives of prints by other photographers, 326 glass lantern slides made by commercial photography studios, and 191 vintage prints, a handful from Reese's negatives, and the remainder by unknown professional photographers. The museum was the sole repository of Reese's photographs, which consisted of this assortment of odd stuff. The record search at the museum indicated that the collection came there in 1945, 31 years after Reese died, and was given by his son, Roger William Reese. The story behind this gift only created more questions. 
In the 1940s, photographer Alexander Aland Sr. had noticed that the title page of How the Other Half Lives announced that the book's illustrations were based on photographs by the author. Searching for these photographs, Aland contacted Reese's son and convinced him to ask the current owners of the house in Queens where he grew up if he might look in the attic for his father's photographs. There he found a box which contained the 415 negatives, 326 lantern slides, and 191 vintage prints that now comprise the Reese collection. The very fact that Reese did not save his photographs is the most important clue to what he thought of them. In contrast to the photographs, Reese organized, annotated all of his papers for posterity. His family eventually gave most of them to the Library of Congress and a smaller portion to the New York Public Library. When Rees sold the family home and moved to Massachusetts in 1912, he left the photographs in the attic. The contents of the box in the attic was given to the Museum of the City of New York because a land teamed up with the curator at the time, Grace Mayer, who prepared, and together they prepared an exhibition, The Battle with the Slum, which in 1947 introduced Rees's photographs to the world. The show featured 50 beautiful prints made by a land from Reese's negatives with quotations called by Mayer from Reese's writings. This comparison of an Alain print on the left and the contact print from Reese's negatives, uh, the, the, the contact print from this negative in the Reese collection gives you some idea of a land's artistry. Alain doubled the size of the vintage prints, which you cannot really see here because I'm just fooling around with. <laughs> you know, reproductions on, a, on this, the, in the PowerPoint. Um, uh, but uh, what you can see is get some sense of his darkroom wiz wiz wizardry in which Alain created rich blacks and detailed highlights. He also cropped out the foreground of the image, eliminating the areas that were out of focus, which brought our attention to the rag pickers in the middle distance. Let's see if I can show you this. He cropped out this basically out of focus foreground so that in his foreground you get a close-up view of these rag pickers that are sitting here among rags against this wall um, so that it's a much more successful and interesting composition by having cropped the image that way which is typical of what Alain did. A huge success uh, the exhibition was widely covered in the photographic press and Reese entered the history of photography as a pioneer of the medium. In 1973, Aland published a very well-researched biography which featured his prints from Reese's negatives and was titled Jacob A. Reese, Photographer and Citizen. Without Aland, Reese's photographs would have been lost, but because of him, Reese became known as a modern documentary photographer, which he was not. In the 1950s, as interest in Reese's photographs grew, the museum had to provide access to the collection, most of which was made of glass and could not be shown in original form. To facilitate researchers and provide prints for reproduction, the museum staff photographer made study prints from all the negatives. Like Alain's prints, these were eight by 10 enlargements, but unlike Alain's prints, they were of poor quality. This was the situation when I arrived at the museum in 1987. Because of Alain's rescue and promotion of Reese's photographs, Reese was considered a major modern photographer. But because of the museum's stewardship, the public saw only poor study prints made from the negatives, and they knew nothing of the additional images available only as lantern slides or vintage prints. Uh, I'm wondering. Okay, sorry, I'll go back to that one. To compound the problem, many photographs made by Reese were, were attributed to him because many of the negatives were copies of prints by other photographers that he acquired. So here's, this is where I need this pointer. If you can see, this is a, Reese has pinned up Jesse Tarbox Beale's photograph with thumbtacks and re-photographed it. So you can see the thumbtacks here. So, and then, and the reason he did this is because he wanted to have a lantern slide made, and I'm showing you the lantern slide on the right, for his lectures. This is a scene of a family making artificial uh, flowers in their tenement home. Uh, and this picture was, because this is a negative, it's a copy negative, 
this was cropped so that you don't see the thumbtacks and you know printed the same size as all the others and so for many many years this image was uh attributed to reese even though it's actually got jesse tarbuck spiel's signature on the negative right down here <laughs> so those were the kind of you know problems that that the the, the collection presented so generally curators have enormous interpretive discretion with collections just by virtue of selecting them and figuring out how to present them. This case, this collection, presented me as the curator with a sort of alarming sense of responsibility because by having to essentially put aside these study prints and determine how to uh, create new prints and how to make the glass lantern slides available as well as the information in the negatives and the, the vintage prints, I was really kind of creating or had the responsibility to create Reese's work, um, which was daunting to say the least. In 1994, and by this time I was not on staff, but I was supervising this project. The museum received a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to create a database of the collection to make color transparencies of the lantern slides and to make contact prints four by five inches, the same size as the negatives, on printing out paper, the type used in Reese's day. The goal was to create prints that looked like the vintage prints that we did have in the collection, and that's where this was in the wrong order, but I'll show you. This is an example of one of the handful of vintage prints that are in the collection that are in decent condition. So this is a contact print, four by five inches, the same size as the negative, mounted on a cardboard, piece of cardboard. Um, <clears throat> so these vintage material prints, as they are called, are what the public now sees, and there's a large sampling of these on view now in the current exhibition. That year, 1994, I wrote an article that explained the NEH Access and Preservation Project. It was titled, What Are the Photographs of Jacob Reese? And it began with a hand-colored lantern slide of Bandit's Roost. You can see that here. This image was meant to surprise and provoke the viewer. You think you know Bandit's Roost? Look at this. And that's what the slide looks like. So this is the kind of material that was buried because the lantern slides were not available to uh, to researchers, but this slide is an example of how Rhesus doesn't look anything like a modern documentary photographer. There's images like this. With the new facsimiles and the database as a foundation, it became clear to me that the collection was not a photographer's body of work, or oof, as sometimes called, but the raw material for Reese's articles and lectures. For him, the final product was the words and pictures together. What was needed was a study of the photographs to delineate which pictures he took, when and for what purpose, and which pictures he acquired, when and for what purpose. The detective work consisted of creating a research folder for each image and collecting in the folder each version of the image, the negative, any lantern slides, and any prints, along with photocopies of each published version of each image. The illustrations in Reese's articles, dozens of them which appeared in New York Daily newspapers and nationally circulating magazines, could be gleaned from the off prints and scrapbooks in the Reese papers in the Library of Congress. In 1976, the Reese papers had been microfilmed, and I was able to purchase a copy of the eight rolls of film, which became my Bible. And any of you who've had any experience with microfilm know how unpleasant an experience that is, but it was vitally important for being able to identify, match up which pictures were taken for which published, which publication. The content of these research folders forms the basis of the current catalog. In 1997, however, I did not aim to produce a catalog. I aimed to produce a narrative about Reese's photographic practice, and I hope to place the five years in which he used the camera within the context of his 40 years as a journalist. As Amy explained, I'm an art historian, not an historian, and for the latter task, I was not equipped. I did not understand Reese's world, which was not that of an artist, but of journalism, politics, law enforcement, uh, and housing at the turn of the century. Doing some preliminary research, I learned that Reese was an important figure in American history, regardless of photographs, um, but for his writings and his activism. 
To get my bearings in the history of the period and to bridge the dialogue in two disparate fields, I needed the help of an historian. By this, um, so I reached out to Dan Sitrum, a professor of American history at Mount Holyoke College. As independent scholars, we were awarded an NEH grant and collaborative research to prepare a book on Reese, which was published in, 19, in 2007 and came out in paperback in 2014. And that's this little book. While Dan and I were working on our book, the museum embarked on a massive digitization of its photo collections, and the Reese collect collection, among others, is now fully available online. As incredible as this accomplishment is, it highlighted a problem. The information that accompanied the digital images online was the preliminary research done in 1994 as part of that original NEH Access and Preservation Grant. The museum was sending serious researchers to me personally to help them better understand what they encountered online, which sent, which sent me time and again to my research files. I realized that there was a real need for a complete catalog of the collection that would place Reese's photographs in the context of his writings and sort out the knotty problems of attribution, that is, to explain which picture he took, which he asked others to take for him, and when and why. In 2012, I offered the contents of my files to the museum and asked if it, if it was interested in supporting the publication of the catalog. The museum decided to sponsor the catalog, a primary goal, and a primary goal of the catalog is to contrast Reese's photographs with the published illustrations, um, which predated the accurate half tones that became standard uh, by the turn of the century, by 1900. This required extensive photography of Reese's articles and books, that is, it required reliance on the Jacob Reese papers here in the library. A dialogue between the two in institutions resulted in a partnership to jointly publish the catalog. For me, this was a godsend. After years of peering at smudgy images on microfilm, I was able to examine the original scrapbooks and letters. It was as if I finally met this man I had studied for so long. At the, as the museum and library worked out a formal agreement, I began meeting with Amy, who edited the catalog, Barbara Baer, curator in the museum, in the manuscripts and archives division, and Cheryl Regan, director of exhibitions. They were invaluable partners who not only brought the catalog and the exhibition into being, but enhanced my understanding of Reese. And Beverly Brannon also, who is a curator in the prints and photographs department, helped me with the, the uh, was invaluable in helping me with the Reese photographs that are also part of the collection here. Having told my Reese story, let me briefly relate the story of Reese as I have come to understand it. Jacob August Reese was born in 1849 in Reba, Denmark, a cathedral town more connected to the medieval past than the industrial present. Reese was a restless, even rebellious child who at age 20 left home for America, a place about which he knew nothing. In his autobiography, he mentioned that he loved James Fenimore Cooper's stories of American Indians, and when he arrived in New York, he purchased a gun, which he brandished and narrowly escaped getting arrested. Although Reese's example is perhaps more colorful than most, his desire to reinvent himself in a new land was a common 19th century story. America was built by waves of European immigrants, Irish, Germans, Chinese, Scandinavians, Italians, and Jews. Between 1870 and 1900, a tenth of all Danes left home for America. This is one of, uh, these by the way are Reese's slides in his own autobiographical lecture. These are copy of his slides, which are in this collection here. Most Danish immigrants traveled to the Midwest as homesteaders and in many instances, they founded their own communities. By contrast, Reese spent five years wandering from place to place, job to job, failing to establish a foothold time and again. The immigrant's sense of alienation, of being caught between old and the new and feeling misunderstood was perhaps extreme in Reese's case. Explaining why he slept on this gravestone in New Brunswick, New Jersey, Reese wrote, the night dews and the snakes and the dogs that kept sniffing and growling had made me tired of sleeping in the fields. The dead were much better company. They minded their own business and let a fellow alone. <laughs> what motivated Reese to continue was his determination to win the hand of Elizabeth Gertz, a girl from Reba, his hometown, who was socially beyond his reach there. Against all odds, she was unmarried when he asked for her hand in 1875, that's after his five years of failure, and she accepted despite the fact that she barely knew him. 
He brought Elizabeth back to America. They had five children and resettled the family in a house with a large garden in Richmond Hill, Queens. Rees succeeded in fulfilling every immigrant's dream of middle class respectability. And this is uh, perhaps not that descriptive, but one of the most charming pictures in, of, uh, of his family snapshots that he took. His house, as you can see in the background, and on this large property they had, that's his daughter Katie uh, with her pet goat. And you can see Reese's um, shadow in the front where he's holding the camera. Reese found the uh, okay. Reese finally found his way in America as a newspaper man. In 1876, he landed a job as a police reporter for the New York Tribune, and later for the Evening Sun. The Daily Police Beat provided his base salary for 23 years until 1899. This was the era of yellow journalism, in which New York's many daily papers competed for screaming headlines and sensational stories. Reese explained. The police, the police reporter on a newspaper is the one who gathers and handles all the news that means trouble to someone. The murders, fires, suicides, robberies, and all that sort before it gets into court. Police reporters shared an office at 301 Mulberry Street across the street from police headquarters in the middle of, the six, of a six ward slum. For eight years, Reese worked the night shift and became boss reporter through sheer hard work. He also honed his storytelling skills, although his articles often read like, read like tales by, by Hans Christian Andersen, a fellow Dane. But he insisted they were true fact. I cannot fict, he claimed. Next to a clipping in one of his scrapbooks, Reese wrote, this was the last Christmas story I wrote for my paper, The Evening Sun. They laughed it to scorn in the office and made no end of fun, fun of it. And yet, of all the stories I have written, I like it best. It moved me more deeply than any of the rest. So in this picture, which is also in the library's collection, uh, that's Reese back there, uh, wait, essentially waiting for news from uh, police headquarters across the street. And this picture is kind of fascinating because, and it's on view right now in the, in the exhibit, because of this wall of uh, photo reproductions from magazines that covers their wall. In 1884, Reese moved from the night to the day shift, and as he said, my eggs hatched. He began by covering the meetings of the 1884 Tenement House Commission, which convened at police headquarters. In this way, Reese learned of the community of philanthropists, engineers, and architects who aimed to change the lives of tenement dwellers. He became a student and advocate of the latest ideas in housing reform, which soon expanded to include education, public parks and playgrounds, public health, and immigration policy. In 1887, Reese read about the German invention of flash powder, in which a powerful burst of light could illuminate scenes photographed in the dark. He had the idea that he could use photographs to show what his words could only tell. Although he had no intention of photographing himself, and at first he didn't, this was a truly revolutionary idea. About this picture, Five Cents a Spot, Reese wrote, I recall a midnight expedition to the Mulberry Bend with the sanitary police that had turned up a couple of characteristic cases of overcrowding. In one instance, two rooms that should at most have held four or five sleepers were found to contain 15, a week old baby among them. Most of them were lodgers and slept there for five cents a spot. There was no pretense of beds. When the report was submitted to the health board the next day, it did not make much of an impression. These things rarely do, put in mere words, until my negatives, still dripping from the dark room, came to reinforce them. From them, there was no appeal. Reese first showed his photographs in January 1888 at the monthly meeting of the Lantern Slide Committee of the Society of Amateur Photographers of New York. The meeting was arranged by two society members who were interested in the new flashlight photography and had helped Reese take his first photographs. Titling his talk, How the Other Half Lives and Dies in New York, Reese showed 100 slides, spoke for two hours, and invited his friends from the press. The extensive press coverage led to his delivering his lecture to various church groups, and the following year, he was asked by two editors of Scribner's Magazine to write an article for this prestigious illustrated journal that circulated nationally. In 1890, Scribner's published a book-length version, How the Other Half Lives, which became a national bestseller. This book was what Reese is most known for and is often considered the beginning of modern photojournalism. However, the book is in many ways unmodern, or at least modern in ways we no longer relate to. 
The revolutionary flashlight photographs such as Five Cents a Spot remain disturbing even today. However, they have been rightly criticized for portraying the city's homeless as hapless victims who were photographed without their permission. Indeed, Reese gave them a good scare. He burst into the room with what he called a raiding party, two photographers, a sanitary policeman, and himself, and set off an explosion. On several occasions, the combustible flash powder caused a fire. During Reese's lifetime, the only times his photographs were seen as photographs were in his lectures, like this, projected on a wall, when they were pro projected on a screen or wall for a live audience. In his article and books, on the other hand, they were most often copied as wood engravings. This explains why the photographs were almost never mentioned in the dozen of reviews of Five Cents a Spot. And this shows Five Cents a Spot in the wood engravings that has appeared in the book. For a century after it was written, How the Other Half Lives was praised as a call to conscience, but in the 1990s, many critics began to fault Reese for relying on racial stereotypes. And this is a picture of an opium den in Chinatown. Indeed, the book is organized as a slum tour in which Reese leads his audience through neighborhoods of Italians, Jews, Chinese, etc. In his day, the slum tour was an established literary tradition which grew out of actual guided tours of New York's neighborhoods, rich and poor. Matthew Hale Smith's Sunshine and Shadow of New York, written in 1869, a generation before, is a classic of the genre. And you can see here this shows the sunshine is the picture of a wealthy, of a huge mansion on Fifth Avenue, and the shadow shows uh, a slum. This actually looks like Five Points, yet yeah, would have been Five Points, which was the most famous New York slum at the t of the time. Um, Reese, Reese's book married the voyeuristic slum tour with a Christian sermon. How the Other Half Lives starts and ends with passages from The Parable, a poem by James Russell Lowell in which Christ chastises men of wealth for ignoring their less fortunate brethren. The book ends with Lowell's question, think ye that building shall endure which shelters the noble and crushes the poor? It was Reese's genius to walk the tightrope between popular entertainment and moral lift uplift, but for a 21st century reader, the book is a relic of Victorian sensibility. Most discussions of Reese do not go beyond how the other half lives, but the book, which was published in 1890 when Reese was 41 years old, marks only the beginning of his reform work. His later career, which is less known, sheds light on other features of modernity. After the success of his first book, Reese immediately got to work on a sequel, The Children of the Poor, which was first published in Scribner's Magazine and then as a full-length book in 1892. And this shows the opening page. The picture on the left is unrelated. It's for another article. But this shows you the first page of The Children of the Poor and Scribner's uh, and features uh, very um, worked over halftone. Again, this is this transitional moment in the in reproductive technology of little Katie who I'm going to introduce you to in a moment perhaps because his subjects were children or because he grew more comfortable with the camera Reese changed his approach to photographing typical of the photographs in children of the poor is little Katie whose picture in a heavily reworked halftone opens the Scribner's article Katie was a nine-year-old whom Reese met on a visit to the West 52nd Street Industrial School, founded by the Children's Aid Society to provide classes for children who did not attend public school. Unlike the raiding party of the earlier flashlight photographs, Reese introduced himself to Katie and interviewed her. He learned that when her mother died, her father took a new wife and she and her older siblings moved out. Katie kept house for them while they worked in factories. About Katie, Reese remarked, this picture shows what a sober, patient, sturdy little thing she was with that dull life wearing on her day by day. She got right up when asked and stood for her picture without a question and without a smile. What kind of work do you do, I asked, thinking to interest her while I made ready. I scrubs, she replied promptly, and her look guaranteed that what she scrubbed came out clean. This new approach in which the photographer shows respect for a subject and gives her a voice is more in line with current values and representational practices. The book, which combined these word and image portraits with Board of Health statistics and a survey of charity programs, was a, cult, was a commercial failure. 
Between 1891 and 1893, Reese used the camera regularly as an extension of his writing. While preparing the children of the poor, he also took a series of photographs of three news for three newspaper exposés dealing with threats to public health. He photographed 11 riverside dumps to show that the law banning rag pickers from living in the dumps went unenforced. He went upstate to the Croton Reservoir, the source of New York's water supply, to document industrial and agricultural pollution. And he photographed the abysmal conditions of nine police station lodging houses, the only municipal shelters available to the homeless. This was investigative journalism in the modern sense, but Reese was too far ahead of his time. And this is one of the photographs of the lodging houses that he took in 1892. This is the New York Tribune uh, from January 1892, an article about these lodging houses. The reproductive technology of the time kept his photographs from being seen at full strength. Newspapers made single line wood engravings after the photographs, which did not look like photographs at all. So just that's the way the picture was seen. Because of an outbreak of typhus in the lodging houses, Reese gave a lantern slide lecture at the Academy of Medicine in 1893. Other than this one lecture, the public never saw these photographs. Perhaps for this reason, Reese gave up newspaper photography in 1893 and used the camera only occasionally thereafter. Reese's life took a new turn in 1895 when a good government mayor, William L. Strong, defeated the Tammany Hall political machine and Strong appointed Theodore Roosevelt as his police commissioner. Having read How the Other Half Lives, Roosevelt walked across the street from police headquarters to Reese's Mulberry Street office to seek his advice. The two men became very close friends and for a short but significant period, Reese had access to political power. Thanks to Reese's advocacy, mostly behind the scenes, the worst of the old tenements, the infamous Gotham Court, and the Mott Street Barracks, and this is a picture taken on the roof of the Mott Street Barracks where families are basically escaping the heat um, of, the, of the interior for the roof. Uh, these, these big, horrible barracks, Gotham Court and Mott Street, were uh, demolished. The police lodging houses were closed, and the notorious Mulberry Band was condemned to construct a small park. This is Reese's photograph of Mulberry Bend. It actually shows the bend in the street, which is still, it's still a street of tenements. You can still see it. And this is the park that replaced it. Um, this is a photograph from 1901, not by Reese. Um, what I mean by saying it's still there is that the park is on, this is torn, this is torn down. This row is still there. Reese also convinced the city con to condemn buildings on the Lower East Side to build two more small parks, Hamilton Fish Park and Seward Park, which continue to serve local residents today. By the end of the Strong administration, which was only one term of two years before Tammany was elected back in, Reese began to take a retrospective view of his decade of reform. In 1900, he published a, a book called A Ten Years War. That's 1890 when his first book was published in 1900 and in 1902 a follow-up which was essentially the same book with more illustrations called the battle with the slum also by 1900 the photographic half tone in which the tonal value of photographs could be economically reproduced with text on the same page was nearly universal in magazines and books as a result there was an increased demand for photographs of all sorts including photographs reese needed for his new books Professionals filled the new demand, and Reese, rather than taking new photographs, began to collect them. Half of his collection consists of photographs of new schools, model tenements, public parks, etc., by professional photographers. In this typical example, Reese wrote an article for Garden Magazine about the Jacob Reese Settlement House, a social service organization on Henry Street on the Lower East Side, which he helped found in the 1880s and which was named for him in 1901. It moved to Long Island City in 1951 and still provides essential services for the community there. The magazine sent a professional photographer to, to take these pictures for the article, and Reese had lantern slides made from them for his lecture 
So these are lantern slides in the collection made from the photographs of this article. Yeah, I think I just showed you the one. When Rees quit his newspaper job in 1899, he began to spend several months a year traveling all over the country, delivering illustrated lectures to fill in for lost income. Lecture bureaus arranged scheduling and billing for this popular form of educational entertainment. For each of his books, Rees developed a slide lecture and traveled the country, very like today's book tours or a TED Talk. So this is actually a lantern slide, but it was a, basically a photograph of a poster for uh, his lecture, The Battle of the Slum, illustrated by scores of original stereopticon pictures of New York City life, is what the, the title says. I don't know. Oh, boy. That is terrible. Uh, it's, it's actually, it's from a microfilm, but I'll just tell you about it. Um, Reese, uh, I don't have the original because it's, well, it's in the collection. It wasn't microfilmed at all. This is from a microfilm from another, from Chicago library. Um, because it was so big, it was just in shreds and sadly not copied here. But anyway, um, Reese used, uh, Reese's use of the mass media, including the lecture surrogate, made Reese, and the nation's face and voice of urban reform. So here's the great story about this, this photograph, this image. The Chicago Tribune, for example, ran a series of seven full page articles, the story of the slum, which uh, in seven weeks in a row, the entire first page of their editorial section. Uh, and so this is the first, this is the first one. It's a and it's called the story of the slum part one. Um, and it shows, uh, some of Reese's pictures and his portrait, all in wood engravings after uh, his after the photographs. Um, so for this, Reese was paid a thousand dollars, which was about twenty nine thousand dollars today. So it gives you some sense of his national reputation. Let's get rid of that terrible picture. Um, in 1901, Reese published his autobiography, The Making of an American, a confessional text built around two characters, his wife Elizabeth and his friend Teddy Roosevelt. The book was published on Reese's 25th wedding anniversary and just months after Roosevelt became president, a stroke of fate due to the assassination of President William McKinley. The story of a poor young foreigner who became a happily married father of five and a visitor to the White House proved irresistible to the public. Reese published a dozen books, but only two, How the Other Half Lives, The Slum Tour and Christian Sermon combined, and The Making of an American, the sort of confessional um, story of rise from poverty to the White House were bestsellers. And this is the uh, silver wedding anniversary uh, photograph of Reese and his wife actually taken by a well-known portrait photographer, Gertrude Kasebeer. Reese's autobiography, <coughs> let me see, I'm sorry. Uh, so, and here is a copy, a uh, cover of the first edition of The Making of an American. Reese's autobiography has been compared to Horatio Alger's contemporaneous rags to riches stories and to the American dream, a term not coined though until the depression. The book also bears comparison to our own confessional culture. Indeed, Reese was mocked in the press for telling all he knows and feels, which makes you feel sorry for him. And his children were teased, he explained, that their father was a bum once people knew the story. Reese no longer, uh, uh, no doubt, enjoyed his fame, but he used his candor to further his cause, not unlike today's celebrities who reveal their histories of sexual abuse or addiction to encourage public understanding of challenging issues. This amusing caricature of Reese pounding on a lectern appeared with a review of his lecture in the San Jose, California Mercury in 1911. The reporter noted, Simple as the story was told, it held the listeners wrapped. If, said Reese in closing, the story of one plain immigrant lad helps you to look with kind eyes on one little unfortunate lad, I shall think my words well spoken. So that's my view of, of my summary of his career and how the photographs uh, enter in. So this is the current book, the catalog. And so to conclude, let me just say a few words about the catalog. In the 1990s, 
when I was working with Dan Citrum on our book. I felt that a complete catalog of the Reese collection would send the wrong message. A complete catalog, or as art historians call it, a catalog raisonné, identifies and describes the complete works of an artist. I was concerned that a book of this sort would reinforce the incorrect notion current at the time that Reese was a photographic artist. Indeed, I had just finished a complete catalog of another major collection belonging to the Museum of the City of New York, Bernice Abbott's Changing New York. Unlike Reese, Abbott was a professional photographer and an avant-garde artist who created one of the great artworks of bodies of work of the 20th century. Photographing New York for 10 years from 1929 to 1939, she defined changing New York by making 305 signed exhibition prints, which she presented to the museum, who super, was the project's sponsor. This kind of artistic intent is exactly what Reese lacked. But over time, the need for a complete catalog became clear. As I mentioned earlier, scholars needed to know the who, when, why story behind each photograph. The book provides the basis for further research in a variety of fields, especially history and media studies. Take Bandit's Roost, for example. This most famous of Reese's photographs was not taken by him. It was taken for him in 1887 by the two amateurs who arranged his first talk at the Society of Amateur Photographers of New York. And it was made with a stereoscopic camera, which had two lenses mounted side by side to produce two images on a glass negative. At some point, this negative was divided in half, and that's why you see the two uh, images separated here. And they differ slightly because the lens on the left shows you more information on the left. Mm -hmm. There's a mother and two little children here on the left. And on the right, you have more information featuring this tough Italian dude with a bowler hat. Reese's four lantern slides of Bandit's Roost were made from the right side, featuring the young tough which better illustrated his point about the dangerousness of the back alleys of Mulberry Bend. This kind of close visual reading is essential for scholars seeking to understand Reese as a photographer. The catalog also serves, though, the interests of the general reader. Reese was wrong that his photographs were of no value when seen apart from his arguments, but they are of much greater value when paired with them. Oh, sorry, that's the stereoscopic camera, so you understand what I mean about the two lenses. Five cents a spot is much more moving when we learn from Reese that 15 people, including a week old baby, were sleeping in that illegal lodging house. And when we learn that little Katie was nine years old, that her mother had died and her father had abandoned his children, and that she kept house for her siblings, the photograph becomes much more meaningful. By studying each of Reese's photographs and pairing it with his words, the catalog brings us closer to the empathetic experience that Reese sought to inspire in his audiences more than a century ago. Thank you very much. I think. There's time for questions. Yeah, a few questions if anybody has any. Can we turn some lights on? Because I can't see anyone. There, yes? What edition of How the Other Half Lives has the best photograph? That is a very good and complicated question. It depends what you mean by the best. Um, you know, I, I'm, there have been, there are so, when you go on Amazon and look at how the other half lives, there are so many editions. Um, the museum has only been giving out these vintage material prints of late. Um, but honestly, I think the best, well, what it, before you said which has the best photographs, if you had just said which is the best edition, I would say the one that copies the original book, that shows the wood engravings and the lantern slides, because then you, it puts the book in context. Um, there was, in the 70s, an edition photographed with a hundred, uh, uh, an edition of the book photographed, uh, cheap uh, but large reproductions by um, Dover Press, you know, very inexpensive, very accessible edition that has 100 pictures in it. They're just chosen arbitrarily by an editor, but it shows you a lot of pictures. Um, there have been 
but I would say there have been other editions that have tried to use the modern prints with the book, but they kind of destroy the book as an entity by interjecting the modern photographs with the story. So um, I don't have, I, I, I sort of don't like those books and I haven't really, so I, don't, I have never really thought about how to answer your question. It's the facsimiles of the original that strike me as the best way to look at the books. And all the pictures are available on the, on the internet, on the museum's website, so that if there's any image that you're interested in, you can see a beautiful, you know, high res scan of it on the museum's website of any individual picture. Yes? Uh, let me ask you, you said that um, obviously in the beginning, um, Taylor was uh, just using photography to illustrate what he was saying. Um, but afterwards, he kind of started to, I suppose the indication is that he started to maybe want to take uh, photography a bit more seriously. Was he ever, uh, did he ever talk about uh, photographers at that time that influenced him? Or did he ever show any interest in that? Or was it just that? You know, he made a different step, and, and that was part of the process. He, 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 wasn't he didn't think about authorship at all. I mean, he, he was not interested in making pictures. You know, his pictures were represented uh, however a publisher wanted to show them. You know, so he would give them a print, one of those prints, like the vintage print I showed you mounted on board, and then they would have an artist interpret it however that magazine wanted to use it. So he was never interested in the follow-up in that regard. When he had those lantern slides made and he wanted those hand, some hand colored that would have more impact, they were colored by, he never worked in the dark room. He, he took, he used the camera, then he went, he took his pictures to a commercial studio. They made prints that he would then give to his publishers. They made his lantern slides. I want a lantern slide of this or that. Make this hand colored or that. Um, he just didn't have a modern sensibility about photography at all. Um, so, and he only used the camera for five years. I mean, he was, this is a guy who wrote dozens and dozens of articles, 13 books, um, was a really skillful uh, writer. And, you know, the cameras, were, the images were critical because of the lectures. I mean, they were absolutely critical. They're really not critical in his books. Um, and they're almost not commented on by reviewers, but the lectures were, he was really aiming at those lectures. And as I say, as soon as he could get the photographs he need, and by that I mean, I mean, I have no idea who the photographers are. You know, there were two by Jesse Tarbucks Beals, who's quite well known, and seven in 1911 that he acquired um, of Lewis Hine from the National Child Labor Committee um, that appeared in one article in Scribner's in 1911, which was a summary of, uh, of the, um, social reform in, this, in, in the country. Um, but other than that, they're just, you know, pictures that were clearly like of public schools that were public, that were commissioned by the Board of Ed or, you know, things like that. I mean, so he wasn't really collecting, there's no indication that he was collecting photographs with an eye to the images, just to the subjects. Yes. How geographically diverse were his lectures? Did he uh, go back to Europe? To, to give no, uh, he traveled the country. There were these. He traveled. He, he started out locally because that was, you know, he was just whatever could come up. He actually there was a mission on the Bowery that actually helped him uh, book his earliest lectures. It was uh, this mission. Um, actually lent him money to have his first group of slides made. And then they actually publicized his, his lectures in the area, in the New York area. And he, the scrapbook shows he's going to Connecticut, he's going to New Jersey, sometimes to Pennsylvania, and, uh, you know, very locally. Um, and, but later, it, when he really started lecturing as a way to make money, that's when he took these national tours and he spent three or four months on the road and they'd be booked by these lecture bureaus. That, and he traveled everywhere. And one of the nice things in the exhibition are the postcards that he sent home to his daughter, Katie, <laughs> that are from the Grand Canyon, from the South, from the, North, uh, from the Northwest. You know, he traveled 
everywhere. And it's really extraordinary to think about because this is the, you know, this couldn't have happened without the lantern slide and it couldn't happen without the train. And it, one of the objects in the exhibition that belongs to the Museum of the City of New York that's here on view is his lantern slide box. It's just a cardboard box covered in canvas and it's really, really worn. You know, and so he carried that box of slides with him on the train all over the country several months a year. And he had a heart condition. He had a pretty serious heart attack when he was 60 and he was told to slow down and he didn't. Um, and he continued and he was constantly going on cures at a sanitarium in, I want to say Michigan, my Barbara, you probably know better than I do, I can't remember, um, but uh, anyway, so he was constantly having to be, having enforced rest, but he ended up dying of a weak, of a weak heart at 65, so he never stopped, but it was really just, he did travel to Europe several times, but his traveling to Europe was more to see his family in Denmark. And then he actually wrote a tremendous amount about Denmark. He wrote this crazy article about Hamlet and Elsinore and sort of saying because there were all these, because, you know, it's like the truth about Shakespeare in Elsinore. He actually went to and, and found the documents in, in the local, um, uh, crazy story. He found the documents in the local, uh, like, city hall that showed when Shakespeare actually visited Elsinore in Denmark and then wrote this article about it. And he has a photograph there, which he didn't take, of Shakespeare's tomb in Elsinore, which he says this is a total fake. It's there just for the tourists. You know, so, I mean, he his travel in Europe was more, like, related to his Danish identity. Um, although he was very involved with English, with English, um, the English were very progressive in terms of social reform, and he sometimes mentions efforts that were done there. So he made an effort to be, but yeah, as far as I know, he didn't give talks there. Yes. Uh, you, in your talk, you touched on um, how the ethics of documenting poverty in the slums has changed over time. Could you just expand? Sure. Um, let's see, how do I do this? Um, I mean, Reese took a real hit in the 1890s, in the 1990s, uh, in the moment of a sort of large attack on the whole humanist tradition of documentary photography, saying that photographers were essentially making their own reputations on the backs of the poor. Um, so you know, uh, Dorothea Lange, Eugene Smith, a lot of these very famous photographers were slammed hard, and people turned to Reese as like the beginning of that of that criticism at the beginning of the tradition that led to those photographers. And, um, and of course, the slum tour. I mean, the name of his book, How the Other Half Lives. I mean, talk about the other. You know, I mean, he's identifying from the get-go. I am on one side describing the poor to, uh, you know, describing the other half to uh, the well-off half. I mean, that is the way he frames that book. And so the book was d heavily criticized for that, as well as the racial stereotyping. Um, what I found was that, uh, what, sort of what my discovery was, all of that is true, you know, about that first book. Um, and that, but then there is that interesting shift in the use of the camera with, uh, you know, immediately, you know, in, eight, in 1891, when he starts photographing for children of the poor, he has a completely different relationship, and as I say, a relationship with his viewers that's very personal, and that's in line with his writing, which is in general storytelling. He abandons the slum tour entirely after How the Other Half Lives. And as I say, the second book, which is more sort of morally um, sound in certain ways, was a complete flop as a book. <laughs> So, you know, people were not interested in really learning about the sentimental story of little Katie or, you know, little Eddie the peddler or, you know, or a buffalo who, you know, was a shoeshine boy. These wonderful tales and their portraits are filled that book. And uh, that didn't catch on uh, with the general public. People actually liked the slum tour. They wanted the sort of peekaboo of the other half. Um, but that's what's so interesting about his... Uh, the second bestseller, because that is really a contemporary view, in which he tells his own story, his own tell-all. I was a homeless, I was a homeless immigrant. I got thrown out of a police lodging house. That is so interesting. It's not really about the photography anymore. 
But in terms of uh, approach to the subject of poverty, that's something that is very much in line with more contemporary ideas of, you know, of people representing themselves and I, I, as opposed to having others speak for them or others represent them. And uh, that is so interesting. I find that really fascinating. It's no longer really about photography. It's just about self-representation and how to, how to um, affect people, how to get people moved to care about uh, the problems of the poor. And it, it may be, and this is like totally armchair psychology on my part, but, um, you know, by the time he wrote that book, he was famous. By the time he wrote that book, he was friends with Teddy Roosevelt in the White House. Mm -hmm. And only from that position of security was he willing to tell that story. When he wrote How the Other Half Lives, his social status was much less clear and much less secure. And so by his identifying himself in, those, in that earlier book as, well, I'm one of you, uh, he doesn't tell the tale that he stayed in a lodging house in that, you know, and that he was thrown out on the street in a lodging house. He didn't tell that story and how the other half lives. Rather, he says, oh, let me tell you about the Chinese. Let me tell you about the Jews. Let me tell you about the Bohemians as a newspaper man, as someone who knows this world through my work, not through my own experience. So that's the kind of shifts that I see that are really important. And again, though, again and again, I mean, I, when I gave talks on the re-show in, in New York, there was always somebody saying, well, wasn't he like a bad guy? You know, aren't these photographs really unethical? You know, and, and all I can say is yes, but what he's a more, a more, a more in-depth study sh shows that his, you know, his ideas about reform and, and representation changed over time. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.